Welcome everyone to Frontiers of Brain Health at the University of Texas at Dallas, where we want people to know every single day what are the newest discoveries in terms of this new science of brain health. My name is Dr. Sandy Vaughn Chapman. I'm the founder and chief director of the Center for Brain Health and a professor at the university. And I've been doing research for three decades in this area. I hope all of you will get a chance to visit us either in person or on our website to see the amazing cognitive neuroscience that's taking place. For the last three decades, we have been exploring neuroplasticity and the brain's amazing ability to rewire itself and to be strengthened and to overcome some of the deficits. What's, what's exciting for me today is to be able to share uh, and to introduce Dr. Michael Merzenich. Mike is, whoa, he is one of our collaborators on the Brain Health Project that you're gonna hear about at the end of the talk. He is probably one of the most revered scientists in the world. We like to call him the godfather of neuroplasticity. While he probably didn't come up with the word, I think he certainly defined the word. And what's so impressive about Mike is not only that he's received so many awards, the Kavli Award, the Russ Award for, from the Academy of uh, Engineering, and he's gotten over 100 patents, hundreds of articles, PBS, books. There is not an article on neuroplasticity that does not mention him. He is one of the most humble, humorous, and truly, uh, I don't know, just inspirational people you will ever meet. When I told him that I want to make, I want him to win a Nobel Prize because of his discoveries, guess what he said? You know what, Sandy? The prize I want is to improve humanity by understanding their brain. Whoa. What an amazing scientist, humanitarian, and noble man. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Merzenich, my friend, my collaborator, and esteemed colleague. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Sandy, it's always a pleasure to see you, and it's a privilege to be with you and with the, with the people in your audience. You know that I strongly endorse and support everything the Center for Brain Health is up to, and I think that you're leading the way to explain to people in the world how this science relates to health and their well-being. And, and that's really the goal, a goal that we, you and I both have, and that's to help everyone have a better life and, uh, and to be safer in life. And so I'm going <laughs> to talk right. about- Mike, gonna... I forgot to tell people, I know you're going to have a lot of questions for Dr. Merzenich while he's talking. So in the Q&A, please type your questions. And if we don't get to some, we'll try to send them. And you can always buy his book or watch him on PBS if we don't get to him, but please type him in Q&A. Okay. Right. So I'm going to jump right into what I'm going to say and talk about, Sandy. And so I'm going to share my screen with the audience. And uh, so we're going to talk about brain plasticity, and we're going to talk about uh, the brain's creation of the, of, which is responsible for the brain's creation of a model of your world and for the control of your operations within it. And of course, every one of us uh, has a different passage in life. And that passage in life is actually shaping the functionality of our individual brains. And, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about this power that we've been endowed with, this incredible ability we have, in a sense, to, to shape our lives, to shape our future, to shape our brains as a function of how we live our lives. And we don't really, uh, haven't really understood this very clearly historically, and we haven't really understood fully how to fully exploit it. So now that those possibilities are just opening to us in medicine and in, 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 in the management of our individual lives. And that's what I wanna talk about. So, so the brain actually made you, the operational person that you are, everything you understand about the world around you has been uh, has he emerged, you could say, as a product of your brain within your lifetime on planet Earth. And whatever your age, you're still a work in progress. So one of the great changes in how we think about our brains in the last 50 years has been the appreciation that the brain 
its plasticity, its capacity to change itself physically and functionally is not limited to an early childhood period, but it's actually with us throughout life. There are actually quadrillions of moments of change of that most incredible machine, actually the most complicated machine, capable of storing as much information as is stored on the internet, you carry around within your skull. And you have, in a sense, at your beck and call through the period of your life on Earth. We're going to talk about that change and those processes of change and how they've contributed to that creation of you and essentially how they can create a better you. And by you, I don't just mean uh, you, yourself, and I, but I mean all of those people that you have the responsibility to helping or take care of if you're a practitioner, if you're a, if you're a therapist, a psychologist, a if you're a medical doctor, whatever, however you come at this, uh, 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 it's, for, it's for your benefit to understand how this is operating. And the three major lessons that we learned from the scientific study of plasticity, and the first is uh, you could say in very crude terms, use it or lose it. You have to use your brain. You have to engage it in things that matter to you. To sustain brain health and to continuously grow our neurological or neurobehavioral competencies, we have to continue to be active acquirers of new skills and abilities all across the span of our lives. One of the reasons that that's so important is because the machinery that supports brain change, and that's another way of saying supporting brain health, the maintenance of brain health, needs to be exercised. And that exercise occurs when you're actively acquiring or improving skills and abilities in your life. And secondly, our brains are specifically benefiting in their brain health and function can benefit from special exercises. Now, you can do a lot of things in everyday life that contribute to the health of your brain, obviously. And if you lived your life in an ideal way from the point of view of neurological health, just as if, if you lived your life in an ideal way from the point of view of your, 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 your physical health, you wouldn't need to go to the gym and you wouldn't need to go to the brain gym either. But actually there are special exercises and Sandy's Center for Brain Health is doing a great job of trying to introduce these possibilities to people in the world. Those special exercises are designed to recover and sustain high neurological performance ability. And we're gonna talk about you know, what you could do specifically that's more in the sort of prescribable or medical realm in a few minutes. And they can also help an individual with their physician's guidance or their, or their, or their uh, therapist's guidance, potentially manage their brain health status. Now, it's really interesting to me that in 2021, there is no brain medicine. And what I mean by that is, is that you go to the doctor and they, the doctor says, hey, Mike, how are you doing? And I say, well, I guess I'm doing okay. I just had my annual brain exam. Doctors wait, medicine, modern medicine waits for a disaster. And once a disaster is clearly in place and can be given a name, then it's treatable. And but this is nonsense. Obviously, we have to consider the health and status of the brain. It should be examined in a sense every time you go to the doctor. And if, if it, it's slipping or sliding or moving in a negative direction, obviously something should be done about it. And what's amazing about it is we have an incredible ability to ask the brain how it's doing in all kinds of relatively inexpensive and inobtrusive ways and if with high efficiency. And more importantly, there are things to be done about it if we have an indication that the all is not well inside the skull. And one great advantage of this is not just to improve your brain health status, but also improve your physical status because your brain plays such an important role in controlling um, uh, Physical, physical, physical aspects of, of, brain, of organic brain health in the physical body. And third, the neurological changes that are associated with normal aging or with other neurological structures are by their nature, by their fundamental nature, reversible. We tend to think of that, about, about uh, life in a, at an older age, especially as a straight path downhill. That is not the case. Almost every aspect of our physical, chemical, functional brain is subject to engagement in ways that actually drive it back to a more healthier or, or more youthful and more effective status again. And that's because the processes that control brain change are designed to be reversible. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. 
So regardless of earlier life history, most older individuals can still recover, can still grow their functional abilities, and can substantially rejuvenate their physical and functional brains. It's really neglectful for us not to recognize this and not to act on it to help older individuals aggressively recover their abilities if that's called for in, in the management of their health. Now, what is changing as the brain is remodeling itself throughout life to make the most of its unique experiences? Well, first of all, brain plasticity is usually described in terms of its impacts on the detailed wiring or synaptic connections of the brain. And, and that, that is profound. Again, there are quad brilliance of moments of transactions, of moments of change in a brain in a lifetime. But it's also advancing its elementary processing machinery in ways that enable the skills and abilities that define the operational person that you are. You can think of it as being born with something that's equivalent to a 70 year old computer. And by actually using that computer, you advance it. And so now if you're an effect, effective and active adult, you have the equivalent of a modern computer because you've actually changed the physical operational characteristics of the machine, machinery within your skull. It changes itself, it advances itself by effective use. Of course, every brain doesn't go through the same, you could say, uh, progression in advance. Some brains are still in a relatively primitive state into adulthood. Uh, it's a shame that we don't recognize that and do something about it because their brains are just as plastic as the next brain and the person sitting next to them. But the brain is also changing many other physical and chemical aspects of the processing machine with those changes driven by its active use. And again, the, the way in which those physical and chemical aspects of its machinery change is very much a function of what happens in their life, early life and ongoing life. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about how the vascular support, but it's just like your physical body. When you exercise your physical body appropriately, everything changes in body health, just about that you can measure, that you can index. It's broadly good for you. And so to your brain, your brain needs exercise very much like your body needs exercise to sustain high functionality in its organic health. And thirdly, when you exercise the brain in life, you're also advancing the machinery that controls change. It's plastic. Now your brain isn't, doesn't, isn't, doesn't come into the world with that machine fully operational. That machinery basically has to develop its capacities, its sophistication in controlling what it allows to change. In the older brain, basically the, the, the brain is monitoring what's happening continuously and it's enabling through powerful neuromodulatory mechanisms, it's modulating when change is permitted. And in a sense, it's only permitting change when it judges that change to be good for itself. And speaking in very loose terms, this is all well understood mechanistically uh, uh, on a first level by brain scientists. And you want to exercise the brain, you want to have that machine very sophisticated in its self-generated control. Now those changes are physical. There's nothing mental about this. This is all physical. It's changing its chemistry. It's changing its physicality in all kinds of ways that account for these changes. And the product of all of the change is the creation of a unique person. And because of its complexity, because of the myriad of changes that are occurring in all of these dimensions of change, because everyone's passage in life that's driving that change is unique. You're unique. Your brain is unique. Every brain is unique. Everyone has a special brain. Every individual is special. No one other brain quite like theirs ever was or ever will be. Now, I want to focus on a key aspect of these processes of neuroplasticity, and that is their reversibility by nature. I believe that this, this, this understanding of the reversible nature of plasticity process is probably one of the most important achievements in brain science in the last 50 or 60 years. We began studying this about 14 or 15 years ago. And, and basically the first kind of model we applied was to give an animal a very lousy early life and then compare the brain of that animal with an animal that had a good life. You could say that had a, a normal and rich early life or by in a second class of experiments, we looked at an animal that was near the end of life expected to pass from this mortal coil within a month or two or three. And we compared a whole series of things in their brains 
to an animal in the prime of life, just full of it. And the first thing we asked about these different animal models was when we look at an animal that's really in the prime of life and, and at their peak of their performance abilities, compared with an animal, let's say that's near the end of life, how many things that we look at? We look at initially at 17 things, so that ultimately we looked at about 40 things. How many of those things are different? And these are physical, functional, chemical things in the brain that relate to its functionality and its health. Everything was different. Everything we measured was substantially different. And then we asked the question, well, how, how many of these things that are different, how many things advantage that old brain? And the answer was none of them. Nothing advances, not, not everything. The brain brains are slower, they're less precise, they're less reliable, they're less functionally developed in all kinds of ways. They're more chemically degraded. They are in short going to hell in every way that we could measure. And then we asked the critical question, if we engage those older animals in brain health relevant, uh, health relevant training, how many of those things are reversible? And the short answer was, and we've extended these studies extensively in human studies from that time to this, the short answer is everything is reversible. Everything we measure is driven back to a relatively youthful state. I might say, we've done this experiment in another way. This experiment was conducted by Xiaoming Zhou in, Shang, in Shanghai. He asked a simple question, well, if I really exercise an animal and really drive them to an even higher level in the prime of life, what will their brain look like near the end of life? And the answer is, they still look like a brain that is most, at most you could say, is in young or, or early middle age. They're still substantially advantaged over an animal that did not have that enriched and younger experience. So what did change? What was reversed? Well, first of all, the whole series of measures of the brain's physical machinery. The brain elaborates its wiring, both on the receptive side, that is to say the dendri dendritic barbers of cells and the cortex, the uh, the elaboration of, 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 of inputs in their synaptic distributions and in, 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 in elaboration of, 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 uh, of, of the terminals of nerve cells. We see that the synapses change themselves in all kinds of ways and spines. We see everything we look at physically, the brain is remyelinating. All kinds of physical changes are occurring. Brain is changing its functional connectivity. It's changing its chemistry. When we look in the synapse, we look at the subunits of synapses, we look in other critical neurotransmitters that are supporting growth in the brain or that are that supporting different operations in the brain that relate to its myelination or its functionality. We see that change chemically. Everything we measure is changed physically and chemically. We see it changes the defenses, its immune response is stronger. We see it changes nutritive support. The cardiovascular unit is much stronger. The, the, we, we plastically impact the, the blood brain barrier. It's resealed again. We see the an elaboration of, of, of capillary in the capillary support of uh, brain tissues that are active. All of these things are changing positively, look like a young brain again. We see its information processing cha uh, machinery change for the better. We see a recording machinery recovered. We see the executive control operations recovered. Everything recovers that we look at in, in functional and physical and chemical terms. It's re rather amazing because the brain is designed, you could say, for all of these things to be driven forward or backward as a function of how we engage it. That's I'll talk about again, about the backward direction in a minute. Now, here are just a few simple examples of physical change that we see in brains consequent from engaging the brains in appropriate forms of learning or, or, or exercise. And here we're looking at myelin basic protein, which is a marker for the creation of new myelin. And we look in a young brain, the brain is making a lot of it. We look at an old brain and the brain is making little of it. We train the old brain and the brain is making a lot of it again. And if we just balance the training or extend the training long enough, we can drive this change so that the older brain looks like the younger brain in its production of myelin, no real distinction. Here's a second example. This is the blood brain barrier. And then the young brain, if we, the, here we're basically introducing a dye into the, into the uh, vascular, uh, uh, supplied to the brain and you can see the old old brains are leaky lots of dye around capillaries in the brain tissues the uh 
the whole brain lights up in the green and the brain not far from the end of life in animals as in humans. This is the primary entrance point for those viruses and mold spores and, and bacteria that are coated by, by, uh, to generate by amyloid to create the amyloid body we know. And, uh, and it's leaky, of course, in an old brain. And it seals, reseals when you train the old brain. Indistinguishable from a young brain. Capillary basically reestablish a patent blood-brain barrier. Here's a third example. We have a particularly important class of inhibitory neurons for generating a highly precise temporal representation of information in the brain. Parvobumin inhibitory neurons are numerous and active in a young brain. They are not active and, and very relatively few functional neurons are expressed in an aged brain and then they're back to their normal numbers in an old brain. And again, if we just titrate it, we just train the brain enough, we cannot distinguish the old brain of an animal, of a rat. Humans aren't rats, but we can't distinguish the, uh, these uh, neuron populations and their functionality. They look just like the brains that, that we see in a young animal, degraded in aging, rejuvenated by training. And in fact, at this point, we're now over 40 specific indices of brain health restored to a youthful status by training. 40 for 40 is a pretty good percentage. So how do you turn an, an old or an impaired brain into a physically and functionally more capable younger one? Well, how do you keep it safer? Well, you train it. You engage it. And of course, neurological rejuvenation will only be achieved with particular forms of training. Brain is seeking particular forms of training, particular forms of engagement, not casual, has to be serious in a particular form. And that, and the exercises that we apply uh, at Brain HQ, and that this is one of the things that Sandy in a, in a brain health center is investigating, is examining, is evaluating, we're specifically designed to achieve that rejuvenation. Well, how do you turn a, a, young, a, a, a young brain into an old one? Why does it go to hell? What accounts for this, you could say, progressive increase of dysfunctionality in the brain? Why does it slowly progress towards dementia, towards chaos, towards trouble? It's very easy, very easy experiment to do. An initial experiment was led by, again, Xiaoming Zhou. And, the and, and, and what it involved was simply adding noise. Or to put it another way, if you increase the chatter in the brain, the noise in the background of the brain, and there are a rich variety of ways to accomplish this. Basically, you drive the brain within a few weeks back in the direction of chaos. That is to say, every one of those initially 17, and again, an expanded list in this direction from subsequent studies in animals and humans, is driven so that the brain looks physically, chemically, and functionally like a brain in an animal that's about to die. So this, these processes are fundamentally reversible. They're relatively easy to drive in a forward or backward direction. Another way of saying it's as if you have a big master switch that throws gene regulation broadly in a positive, that is to say growing, or a, or a negative, that is to say degenerating direction at will. Now you could say, well, why the blazes would a brain be designed to support bidirectional plasticity? And it's a little bit difficult for me to talk about without taking too much time, but, but fundamentally, I believe the reason that this is in place is because your brain, a brain is designed to get the answer right to the best of its ability. And it's always progressing on the basis of outcome. Outcome is determining whether or not plasticity is enabled in a brain. Basically, the brain is evaluating the success of what you're doing. And if you are successful in the main, basically it expresses those neurotransmitters. We know this, that say basically save that change. That change is a good one for the brain. And when you begin to make, when the error rate increases, basically it, it moves in the opposite direction. It throws you in reverse. And it does that so that it can sustain control Con sustaining control is crucial for survival, obviously. You could think of it as the brain is designed to go as fast as it can, with as, with as high as accuracy as it can, move as far in an approving direction as it can, as long as it can, can stay, sustain high performance. That's what it's up to. It's basically designed to make the most of you and what your life is if you engage in an appropriate way. 
Now, in, in human studies, we've translated these, these, this science, you could say, into brain exercises that we can deliver via the internet on computers, pads, and smartphones, because we basically want to provide this same uh, class of benefit, the benefits that come from appropriate forms of training to individuals that could, 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 whose brain health could be improved and sustained by their use. So those, that, that, this is a little bit of a commercial, so understand this, I apologize for this. I'm working hard to translate these things to the benefit of, of individuals. Uh, you know, it's hard, it, it means that you work to translate it out into the world to help them. Uh, so, um, and there are other alternatives to this in life and, 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 and things you think you might, but anyway, I just wanna say this is our attempt to drive this uh, form, form of help into the world is to provide this to people, this form of help on computers, pads, or smartphones. The training is adaptive. That is to say, it, it applies to individuals no matter where they are in the spectrum of ability. It's optimized for rapid gains. Uh, we know the rules that govern plasticity. We know how to change the brain at will. So we know how to drive it in the most rapid and effective way in an improving direction. It's targeted to recover key abilities, the normalized brains, lots of things can need help in an old brain or in a defective brain and a brain that's struggling. It's extensive to achieve rejuvenation at all brain system levels, because that's what you have to fix. You can't just think about the highest functions. You have to think about all levels of functionality. It continuously validates outcomes, uh, uh, maybe uh, 40, 50 times in an hour. It's measuring outcomes. It's defining the limits of your performance and it's trying to ratchet you up progressively to higher and higher performance levels. It's proven to work. There are more than 100 gold standard trials to, with published results in approaching 300 uh, refereed scientific reports. There are more than 400 trials in the world underway as I speak using these training strategies. It can be clinically monitored because everything a person does using these tools can be uh, recorded by the software and basically can be reflected back to a medical doctor or to a, or to a uh, therapist, a practitioner, a psychologist via the internet. And it's scalable. Uh, that is to say, it's relatively and it's almost free. It does not really add very significantly to the medical care of costs or to the clinical support of any individual that might benefit from it or use it. Now, uh, systematic changes can be driven uh, by using these tools. And those that, that are associated with normal aging, there are systematic changes in functionality that are associated with normal aging. And all of those declining abilities can be rejuvenated at any age by training. And I wanna say a little bit about this. And one of the critical uh, dimensions that, that, that is in play is brain speed or processing speed. Brain speed typically undergoes a dramatic decline with age. If we just look in the general population, this, this is from a wonderful historic series of studies by University of Virginia professor, Timothy Salthouse. And he just documented processing speed as a function of age. And here we see progressing from 20 to 90, you reach a peak in your, maybe in your early thirties. And uh, by the time you, uh, 90, you've had a very substantial decline. This is a big red dots uh, in processing speed. And that's very substantial. It's a loss from the peak of about a standard deviation for every three decades. So moving from 30 to 60, you're down a standard deviation for, across the distribution and to your 90th birthday, down two standard deviations. Two standard deviations is a big difference. And you can see that everything else measured that's not information-based, everything else, the, the exception is something that's information-based, growing vocabulary, of course that takes the growing but every other fundamental ability, reasoning in this case, spatial visualization, episodic memory, and I could put a list of uh, 30 other things on that, on this, fun, on this plot, goes down in parallel with processing speed. Now, why is that? Well, it's because processing speed, brains that are fast, have to be physically, chemically, and functionally well endowed. Processing speed is the single most valuable index of organic brain health. Now it turns out all of these declining abilities can be rejuvenated at any age. And here's the example of processing speed. So here we have processing speed and here the, here the plot is flipped. Upper is poorer, down is faster. The smaller numbers, they're faster. And we, what we see is a decline in what the upper and the untrained population are shown in red. 
And we see here moving from 20 to 90, processing speed again is going to hell as a function of age in this large population of brain H2 users, in this case, about 4,000 people. And now we've trained all of those people an equivalent amount of time. And we see everybody's improved about the same. Now there's a, there's a theory, there's a hypothesis that older people can't learn that can't improve at something like processing speed, but they can. Once the machinery of the brain, you could say, has been engaged in ways that enable that change. Now, if we just look at, again, brain speed is measuring, uh, provides us with an important indicator of the brain's performance abilities and its organic health. Now, if we just look at the recovered speed of a, of a 65 year old or 70 year old, this is a 70 year old, we see that after they're trained by this limited period of time, their processing speed is equivalent to an untrained 20 year old. That's relatively easy to achieve. And it's not relatively easy to sustain an improvement of processing speed that is important to the individual. So this is just like the animal. You rejuvenate the ability, and we see this in function after function as a consequence of training. Now people argue, well, training like this, you're working on a computer, this training is not generalized. It's limited to the skill. No, it is not limited to the skill. We've changed the fundamental operational characteristics of the machinery of the brain. And everything it uses is endowed, is, is enabled by the improvement of processing speed. And the machinery of the brain is changed in this fundamental and elemental way. Now again, performance gains in attention and speed must arise from a coordinated series of brain rejuvenating physical changes. That's the only way the brain can get faster, can be faster. Now it's easy to calibrate yourself in a dimension like processing speed and brain HQ, we've designed it to accomplish that. Uh, so you can look at your percentile rank for a person, of, for example, of my age, now I happen to be um, 79. And, and, and when you look at my percentile, this is for a recent period of brain HQ exercises, you can see that I'm at the 92nd percentile. I'd like to be higher, but that's it. That's, the, that's all, the, all the better I can do. At this moment, I'm working on it. But if I was 20 years older, you could see I would be at the 79th percentile. And that's pretty good. I know that there's about a 50-50 chance that a person over my de next decade of life will be demented. Uh, and I'd, I'd rather not be demented, so I want to be well above average. And that's another way of saying that I have a strategy, anyone has a strategy, by using tools like this to monitor their brain health and potentially to manage it. So why does the brain basically lose its functionality? Why does it go to blazes? Well, first of all, we grow noise, noise in our brain in the modern life by how we use it. And we spend, uh, the average citizen spends about 10 hours a day sitting in a chair, largely staring at things. Uh, maybe responding mostly, and this is what they mostly stare at, they stare at a screen. And they're mostly uh, looking at information that's appearing or provided to them on that screen. And they're reacting to it, again, emotionally, but not in, not in uh, too many other ways. They're certainly not physically reacting to it very strongly. Maybe they're moving their fingers and hands like little robots, but that's as far as it goes. And they, they, whenever they're out in the world, they, they, they don't really know the way, they don't really know their world very well. They don't have to, they can look up how to operate in it, how to find their way in it, that's easy. And then the, that world out there is paved. There's nothing, no challenges to it. We've done everything to reduce the challenge. All kinds of devices, all kinds of strategy. We've paved the damn world so that every footfall is certain. That's very unnatural. That's depriving us all kinds of ways to exercise our brain. And then we look up the answer to everything. We don't use our brain and its reasoning powers as we're supposed to. And we look up the answer to everything. I, uh, in, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's useful. It's useful to know that you get the handkerchief out, but, but really uh, we overdo this tremendously. But, but beyond this, besides the fact that the modern citizen of the world has habits that encourage the growth of noise in the brain, also all kinds of vicissitudes can occur in a life. And we've contributed to this list of vicissitudes greatly in our medicine and in our modern life. And, uh, and a consequence of all of that is that all of us basically have things that are contributing to, and these are all things that have been demonstrated to increase the likelihood of an earlier onset of dementia. 
Every one of these things is on the, and I, I could add to this list from epidemiological literature, another 50 major or substantial things. Life is full of vicissitudes. If you just scan this list, you could probably see one or two or things on this list that apply to you, that apply to almost anybody. And those should be for a medical doctor or for someone caring for people on any level as a therapist, they should be a call to action. They should be a call to action for reducing that noise, for driving that plasticity switch, for throwing it in the opposite direction. Because given brain damage, you could say that's contributed by factors like this, you can throw that switch back in a growing direction. So finally, I wanna talk about a, an example of, of, of how from a, from a, a large a controlled trial, how you can drive the brain back in a growing direction. And the example is the active trial, which is a trial that was conducted initially with brain training, applied about 15 years ago. And uh, uh, that's important because we're gonna track forward the fates of people that were involved in this trial. And the initial training involved training for 10 hours on a particular uh, brain HQ exercise uh, uh, brain HQ exercise is, is called double decision at brain HQ. And uh, it was initially developed by uh, Carleen Ball and colleagues uh, in uh, Dan Ronker. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, Carleen Ball is a professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. It was actually initially developed to help uh, uh, driving ability in older individuals but it involves speed of processing training in a particular way in which you're looking basically in a divided attention task called double decision. And as a consequence of training for that 10 hours, basically you, 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 you double the speed of processing in the visual domain. And in this study, basically the 600 people were trained and then they looked at a year later and, 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 and it's found that their ability, their the speeded up brain was still speeded up they, they, they resolved a year later that they needed to train about an additional hour to have the brain be just as fast as the brain. In fact, in fact, they need about one additional hour per year to sustain that processing speed at this twice as fast level. But at one year, they took half of the population and they also trained an additional two to four hours, the same task. And then they waited for another two years and another two to four hours for that same half other, other population only got the initial 10 hours. They looked at five years out without no additional training. So they've had a total of 10 to 18 hours. About five years, they asked, well, how fast are, is their brain? And they're still very fast, much faster than they were before they were trained. These individuals were 74 when they started. They're now approaching 80. And now they look five years later and they're still faster than before they were trained with no additional training. It's another way of saying that when you speed up a brain, it uses its, you could say, faster machinery to sustain itself to, to a substantial extent. Now, they could have continued to train, you could say, they could have re-upped every year to make sure the speed, is, but they didn't do that. They stopped training seven years before. And now they look at the performance abilities of these individuals across this time, and they find mostly in the first five years these studies were conducted, half as many traffic accidents far safer driving, reliably sustained driving mobility, more confident, effective driving. All of these things were important in the lives of these individuals in sustaining their independence. They found improvements of everyday performance abilities, protection against senior depression. If they got depression, it was much milder in form, better sustained independence, better health, better quality of life, less everyday functional difficulty across 10 years. And they had a 29 to 48% reduction in dementia incidence. So the biggest effect was seen for people that had those tiny little, those tiny little booster shots. But everybody um, across the whole population there were highly significant effects. Now I might say this group has also, also recorded, subsequently recorded changes that occur uh, that that that, that uh, differences in longevity, and they'll report that soon. You can expect an individual that's trained in even this incredibly mild way to live longer. And the reason that you can expect that is because we know that it's impacting the machinery in the brain that's controlling brain to body 
effects, including the modulation of, of, of autonomic nervous system and integrity of autonomic nervous system operations and its regulation of immune response. So what changes then when you engage uh, individuals in, 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 in this way? What changes? Everything changes. And what can be reversed by training? Well, it looks like everything we measure can be reversed. And how difficult is it to reverse the course of change? Well, if a person will cooperate, if they can cooperate, it seems to be relatively easy. And how can training in humans delay block? Can, it, can they delay block the progression to dementia or to Alzheimer's disease? Well, apparently, and to us unsurprisingly, yes. Now I might say that, of course, this is still a work in progress. There are now six major trials that are applying. And the most important of these is the Center for Brain Health Initiatives. I mean, that's the largest in scope and scale. Uh, and uh, in which are, this strategy is being applied to evaluate whether or not it can increase health and longevity. And, uh, and, and there's just a very large supported trial now, $44 million grant that's been given to a University of South Florida scientists that will apply these tools, again, to more extensively look at the impacts of health and longevity in, in senior populations. And finally, the science is providing us with a straightforward basis for managing brain health. I mean, we can evaluate the status of brain performance in relatively simple, using relatively simple uh, internet delivered uh, pro computer and, and, and uh, pad and, and phone delivered tools. And we can use that basically to manage brain health, to act when necessary to sustain brain function and health. Now, I just, uh, I'd also like to say that brain exercise is not just about health. It's also about ability. It's about how you're doing. It's about how your performance is growing in life, how your, how your operations are growing in life at any age. Every one of us should be advancing ourselves continually in life to the extent that, that, that we're capable of doing that. And, and, and basically we can drive improvements to the brain no matter how good we are at things at almost any age. This is a classic example. Now, Tom is an advocate of use of, of brain HQ. And he attributes uh, his, this is one of the significant factors that's contributing to sustaining his high performance ability. We've trained many law enforcement personnel and one of the targets in law enforcement personnel has been to improve the performance and sustain the performance abilities of older policemen, older, older law enforcement uh, individuals. And we found that when we train an individual, they're, in, in a relatively abbreviated period of time, 20 to 30 hours, they improve their performance. They, 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 they very much less also often, less often resort to violence in their physical reactions in policing. They have very many few, you could say customer complaints from the people they're policing. They're much more accurate in their judgment, in their high-speed judgment and when they think they should defend themselves much less frequently making tragic mistakes. We're also training uh, soldiers and every, every individual in the Italian army, Navy SEALs, other special operational forces. We're training individuals, this is a great uh, European uh, uh, football player that uh, won the most valuable player award in the last World Cup. He's a Brain HQ user. There are many such individuals. We've trained in individuals in high risk professions and basically have cut their accidents more than in rates, more than in half. Uh, we've trained all kinds of uh, work, work in all kinds of workplace environments. But we could train you. You could train yourself. You can improve your own abilities. We've also been uh, trying to extend this training, for brain health management and recovery, strengthening strategies to help school-aged children. And this is another big goal of the Brain Health Project. It's a wonderful extension of what they've been doing in older age populations. We're trying to administer a brain check. Our goal is to administer a brain check for every child at the beginning and the end of every school year, to educate every child about their brain and about life factors contributing to its health, to apply a combination of emotion control, social cognition, and brain health performance targeted truth tools to assure that every child has an organically healthy and operationally effective brain. Of course, we can't do that in every child, but we can get to almost every child to address emergent brain health issues by individuated intervention through the course of subsequent school years, bad things happen to children. 
Many children are subject to older age abuse or bullying or all kinds of other problems that basically are backward, send them backward in their brain health. And we're trying to, uh, uh, we're trying to identify and, and, and adapt to that and compensate for it. And the goal is to grow neurological and performance powers to increase resilience in ways designed to forestall or otherwise likely uh, block the forward progression to psychiatric illness. I think most psychiatric illness emerging in children, most psychiatric does emerge in children. I think most of those issues are preventable. Addiction is preventable, large substantially, oppositional violent behaviors, criminal offending, social disorders, all of these things. The goal is to change the course of human society the, the, the effective structures of human society in ways that can uh, bring a, a rational, a more rational approach to improving the lives of every human being on this planet. So finally, a little unasked for advice for you. Stop worrying about personal decline. Focus instead on personal growth. Second, live life to the advantage of your brain. Challenge yourself by seriously improving your performance on all of your mastered skills and fill your life with a heavy diet of new learning and new skill development. You're just a fool, the damn fool not to do this. A three, calibrate yourself. You can calibrate yourself on Brain HQ or you can self-calibrate. Once you understand the principles, you can see how fast you are. You can see how effective accurate we are. You can appreciate how you are or are not slipping in ways that matter. And if you're not near the top of the heap, for an individual of your age, you gotta to get to the brain jam or you gotta do things in, in, in lifestyle that are gonna compensate for those losses. Adopt a charitable and social view of the world because every time you help, you're actually engaging the modulatory control machinery that basically is sustaining you, sustaining your brain, sustaining its health. Every time you make someone happy, you can control that. You can't control every time they make you happy. Every time you do that, your brain is a major beneficiary. Face up to the natural vicissitudes that befall almost every life. If some, one of these applies to you, multiple uh, ent entries on that list are part of your life, actively and aggressively challenge yourself to overcome them because you can as a rule. And smell the roses, seek out the surprises, listen, be engaged again. Be like a white owl. Don't take advantage of all of these things that remove you from the world so that you can live life like a zombie. You know, sustain your connection with the world. Get out there and live in it again. Seek new ways to do all the simple things. And get off the chair and out, off the pavement and live your life as if it really mattered because your brain will thank you. And I thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, for more on Ask For Advice, you can read my book. So. Mike, I think everyone can see why he's such a guru of why we revere him so much and the humanitarian award i'm just you have we have so many questions i'm going to get to as many as i can but thank you for just so much inspiration and one of the big things that a lot of people have are asking questions of, about and i think you addressed them in the, many in the end right. um is what it, can you really if you already have a diagnosis right. of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or brain injury, right. Right. what is the extent to which you can reverse the losses? Right. Well, this is a complicated question. And, and as you know, Sandy, this is somewhat a work in progress. So we've done extensive study or we've supported extensive studies. This has all been done in university-based efforts uh, in individuals that have mild cognitive impairment. And uh, so these are people in a, in a sort of pre-Alzheimer's situation. There, there have been uh, eight published reports. Nine, uh, seven of them report very strongly positive uh, outcomes. The, the eighth one uses, used a different uh, repertoire of brain HQ exercises, and it did not show a positive outcome. But the other seven did very, very big changes. And they showed changes that would be described as rejuvenating and, and, and re restoring connectivity in brains that had been, been substantially disconnected. And, and also a whole host of uh, obviously generalizable effects, not just in the brain, but in physical health. 
So one example is, is a, reconnect, a reactivation, you could say, of the, or in, improvement of the integrity of autonomic nervous system control, which we'll probably foretell for, that in, for those individuals a longer life. So to make a longer story short, in this pre-Alzheimer's case, the results are very optimistic. And this is a basis now of an extend, extended study that we're, we're trying to now conduct an extent. I know you're very interested in this at the center yeah, right as well. Absolutely. And you know, I think about all the money we're throwing at drugs alone, and it's, you know, as a sil silver bullet approach. Right. But as people begin to realize this prevention approach, right. what it means. So right. how how do you think as a society, you know, you and I both feel this way that everything for the brain is always right a boom after something right. happens and right. diagnosed. Right. How can we move society well, and medicine to left a boom to right. really start young from kids to no, I'm, really I'm, change that? It's a great question. And I didn't really answer the first question. That is what if you're over the cliff, right? And if you're over the cliff, there are a lot of things to do if, you're, if you have Parkinson's disease, especially an early diagnosis. Parkinson's disease is a, is a consequence of having a, uh, operations that are relatively stereotypic. You need to actively and aggressively acquire new skills and abilities that relate to movement control and relate to mental operations. You need to do that. But you also need to think actively about how to keep your brain alive because once you have the diagnosis, there's a high likelihood that you'll advance to dementia. So get yourself in action in trying to, 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 to improve your brain health and basically try to recover your ability to control your actions insofar as you can by continuous new skill acquisition, skill learning. That's really important to do. And, that, and when, when people do that, they, they're relatively long lived and healthy and can get back to work again and do all kinds of things that, they, that was not believed not, not so many years ago people could do. Now for Alzheimer's disease, We've been studying combinations of things like uh, dietary supplementation and, and other uh, neurological strategies with a combination of brain training. And that seems to be the most helpful strategies. I mean, once the, all of that water is over the dam, it's more and more difficult. It should be all about prevention. And the last thing I'd say about this is that why can't we, we know that there can be strategies for detecting a future of Parkinsonism or a future of dementia long before it ever emerges. And there's really nothing about either one of these conditions that should be called a disease. This is an expected disastrous end stage of a brain that's not well taken care of. It should really all be all about sustaining wellness. It should be all about living a life so this does not happen to people. And that doctor should be managing that. They should be managing the health of that individual. They should be evaluating risk of Parkinson's disease. So they see it coming 10 years out. And that's true of every neurodegenerative disease. And when they see that coming, they should act. So what I believe is that if they did act, I also believe this applies equally strongly to psychiatric illness. Mm -hmm. Since most of it arises in childhood, 75, 80% can be attributed to things that happen early in life. Why don't you detect those things happening neurologically? And why don't you address them neurologically? And why don't you determine whether or not that will impact the progressive? This is what we're trying to do in our child, as you are. We're both trying to accomplish this in our child health progression. And I, I might say, uh, Sandy, you're group has been just a wonderful collaborative resource, just a fantastic, you know, and you're really done something special in trying to get to all of these, all of these individuals with all of these. And so that's, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah. And your partnership means so much. So, you know, being able to collaborate on this, one of the other questions here, Mike, is can you address the impact of alcohol on the brain health? And when there's serious loss of brain function, can you regain it from doing exercises? Yes, that's a great question. And, uh, and there, of course, there are all these problems that relate to uh, uh, the impacts of alcohol or drug, you, you know, uh, recreational drug, other things like this on, on brains and their long-term consequences. And, and what, what, I, what I have to say about this, of course, the brain is set up for addictions. 
it basically it seeks reward. It basically, basically, it, 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 when it rewards itself, it's, you could say driving, it, 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 it gives us a capacity to drive our brains into a hole. And we have, we have created profoundly effective ways to drive our brains in, into, into the hole, you know, not just alcohol, but in all kinds of other ways. We, we, we're set up for addiction. And of course, you can address this because you can weaken the factors neurologically that contribute to that. So first of all, you can, and this is, this is a highly effective assistive way to reduce the, 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 the uh, stranglehold that condition can have on an individual. But then the person who has, who, who has uh, abused alcohol or used alcohol to their detriment also has neurological changes that are all reversible. Nothing about the changes that occurred that are not reversible. Now we haven't thought about this in general across our interventive strategies very completely or intelligently. I think this is one of the big things that we're going to see that that is to say, we see somebody that has a challenge like this, we're going to be more and more specific about how we would think about basically bringing that person back fully back in a sort of uncompromised and more complete way uh, to be a full, full, full card carrying member of a healthy society. It's all about brain health. It's really all about brain health. It is. That's what I say every day. Without brain health, you don't have health. What do you think about the idea of people just having their own baseline start? Each of us has our own starting lines. We're obviously not all Tom Brady's. Right. Everyone's not all Mike Mersenick. Right. Rather than everyone being in the top one percentile, what about us uh, thinking every year, is my brain 1%, 2% better than it was last year? Whatever my starting line versus this idea of uh, the norms. Oh, I think that I think that's absolutely right. I think what we're trying to do. I mean, it's great to 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 know that you're you're uh, you might be back into a better position, and you might be above normal at some point if you keep working at it. But what's really crucial is, is that you you un, that you continue to grow. You continue to grow in your abilities and your operational capacities because we all have this within our power. Every one of us, well, what, what happens in a, commonly in an older life is that we begin to rest on our laurels. I mean, there might be things that we love to do, but we're in a sense satisfied with our performance at those things. And so we're no longer engaging our brain as a learning machine. And the learning machinery that's controlling our brain, that's controlling change, is basically shut down. We need continuous progression. We need to see ourselves and we should celebrate every advance. We should celebrate every move in a positive direction. And uh, I, I, in, in, uh, well, I have to ask you this, who, who, what is your greatest naysayers or hurdles that you think we have to get this front and center? Well, I think that there is in medicine itself in the core of medicine, uh, still a large uh, population of medical doctors, uh, neurologists, and in, in a sense, the more specialized they are, the more they know about how to address these issues. And they, they're, you know, tremendously talented people that can operate on the, you could say from the, in pharmaceutical medicine or, or in, uh, in psychiatric medicine, beyond ph pharmaceuticals in all kinds of ways. Uh, they have strategies that they believe in, that they know work, but they aren't educated to an adequate degree about this science. And, they, and they, it really hasn't been translated in, in a way into forms in which it's useful for them to refer to people. So they neglect it. And I think that basically their education, the transformation of how they think about this is one of the most important things that could happen in, across uh, human societies. But I also think that it applies to educators, it applies to, it applies to the average citizen. Yeah, and it certainly applies in the domain of psychology where people have attempted through you know, behavioral training and, 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 and ways to help people and do help people in all kinds of ways but they haven't fully in, adopted these, this neuro, neuroscience-based approach. They don't understand that it represents part of the evolution of their strategy. And it's a way to improve and strengthen the impacts they can have in helping people. And wow, there's so many, so many questions. I'm gonna ask one more and then I'm gonna talk to you about the penultimate brain. But right. one of the questions is in terms of bipolar, when you have an organic brain disease, such as mental illness, 
Right. Can you really promote brain health in when it's an organic disease, when you talk about organic brain health? Well, there are control trials that have been conducted using our strategy on patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder. And, and they're all positive. The life is better as a consequence of applying these strategies. Okay, they're, they're better. That's not to say that they're normal. Uh, because it, that is to say, you, uh, some people are, are basically restored in life and they're in case of bipolar, because you always have to worry about some progression, some cycling into some level of relapse. But we see basically very substantial improvement in many, the majority of individuals. And, and, uh, but this is a work in progress. We're st still trying to understand once the water again is over the dam, how to reverse all this chaos that's occurred. It's because what happens, the brain is plastic and once you're in the dis dis distorted state, things change. And, and they change in ways that make it the reversibility more and more difficult or more and more complicated. And that's why it's so important to think about this more often. When the person is stable, to do whatever you can to strengthen them so they never go through another cycle, so they never fall into a period of mania, so they never dive back into a period of deep depression. Yeah. That is yeah, absolutely a key. So I think, I think all of you from the audience, I mean, we have tremendous, I think almost every person that signed up tuned into you and know, everyone will be glad. If you didn't get to hear it, tell your friends it will be, you right. will get to listen to this. What the last question I want to say, and then I'm going to do a plug for the Brain Health Project, of which Dr. Mersenick's Brain HQ is part of because the research is so phenomenal. But I want to ask you about are you building a penultimate brain yourself, Mike? Because you are, as we get older and have more knowledge and wisdom, and yet the workings of a younger brain, don't you think we're building a penultimate brain? I do. I do. I think that, I think that, that, uh, I think that uh, I am better and more effective now in a lot of ways than when I was younger. And I certainly can do things that I couldn't do when I was younger on, one, on the one hand. On the other hand, <laughs> there are other things I could do when I was younger that I can't do now because things happen physically in an older person. And, uh, and uh, so it's not all, you know, we do eventually, it does eventually come to an end. But I also believe that, that what, I just wanna say two other things. One is, is that you have to understand that there's been a massive underestimation of the importance of brain health on general health and longevity. Mm -hmm. And people have way underestimated the impact the brain has on sustaining autonomic nervous system control, immune regulation, physical health in the body. The brain is impacting every organ in the body in ways that contribute to sustaining it. We know this in a negative way too, because we know that when you have a very difficult life, you don't live very long. And that's coming from the brain side, right? You basically want to sustain brain health to sustain life itself. And so, and, and, in, order, and, and in that life itself, you need to continue to grow. You need to continue to grow. And why not grow until you die, leave this mortal coil? I think that's possible. And I think that should be your goal. Now, the last thing I wanna say is, don't be afraid, people in the audience, to communicate with me. Just like I, I, I know you won't be afraid to communicate with Sandy because we're here to help. That's what, that's what this is about. You know, I'm dedicated to helping as many people as I can, children and adults, in finding their way to a better life, to better health. And uh, so don't be afraid to communicate with me and ask me a private question or I'll probably answer it or send off, off the uh, question to another person that can come up with a better answer. And Mike, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree Very more. I love, so Mike and I, we, we are partnering together because we want to reach 7.8 billion people on this earth so that every single person from poverty all the way to gifted become the best genius version of themselves. Thank you for this. And, you know, just to remind you, the Brain Health Project, that Mike is one of our key collaborators, the godfather of neuroplasticity, who wouldn't want to be able to dance with him? Uh, we want you to be able to sign up uh, to take advantage of the Brain Health Index, of our trainings to learn how to use this amazing engine 
inside your head starting very young and not waiting till something happens, like he said. So scan this QR code, spread it with your community, and let's see how far, how fast, how fit we can build Tom Brady's brain, but really Mike Merzenich's brain. That's my goal. So if you're interested in CEUs, please visit the centerforbrainhealth.org CEU. And you will all want to also join us April 30th for our next Frontiers with the amazing Dr. Eric Nessler from Mount Sinai. Thank you for joining us. Mike, now I know why you win the Nobel Prize of Humanitarian. Brilliant, brilliant talk. I'm smarter already and my brain's changed. Thank you. It was fun, fun to be with you. Thank you. Thank all of you for joining us. Bye-bye. We work, we live, we innovate, and create. At the center of it all is your brain health. The ability to solve problems, think analytically, share empathy, and thrive. We're trying to make brain performance really the next fitness revolution. So how do you boost brain power? Welcome to the Brain Health Project, an urgent call to transform your mind to work stronger and faster. This is an absolute crisis as great as any we have ever faced. We have to equip the minds and brains of our citizens to cope with the accelerating, dizzying rate of change that they face in their lives. Your brain health is not fixed. Scientific discoveries prove it can adapt and grow regardless of your starting point. Our greatest value, the asset that will help us to change everything, every problem we're in, is all in our head. To harness that treasure, we must measure and monitor progress while things are going well versus waiting for an injury or disease to strike. Too many of us are outliving our brains, and that does not have to be the case. The information age is bombarding us with more content than our human brains can handle. How do you keep from getting lost in this and focus on deep thinking? For starters, stop multitasking. Science shows us that multitasking is bad for your brain. It reduces fluid intelligence, causes brain atrophy, and increases chronic stress. The global pandemic is creating more stress than ever. Stress that leads to depression and anxiety and beyond. Unlocking our potential to navigate these hurdles starts with learning the right strategies, even in school. So when teachers have these strategies, they're empowered to support our learners, and then the learners are now able to take ownership of their learning. Training kids how to think is doubling academic achievement among middle schoolers. I think the greatest national security threat is pre-K through 12. If we don't take care of educating our young men and women, then we have to ask ourselves, where, where are we going to be in 20 years? Our world-renowned scientists know you can increase your brain health, not lose it. It's time for a new category of health, brain health. You are a game changer. Ready to transform the world with us? Be a part of the brain health revolution. It starts here.